then on the one hand, you travel the world, you do these live shows, you make TV series. On the other, you're teaching first year students at Manchester mm -hmm. Uni, you're working on the Atlas experiment in Switzerland. Where are you happiest, showman, teacher or physicist? Um, I think that there shouldn't be a distinction, actually. The, I think one of the most important things now is, is for academics to become part of popular culture, if you want to put it like that. And the, the reason is that we live in a society that's built on science and therefore people need to know. They need to know about current discoveries and particularly, I think, about the way that scientists thing can do science, what, what science is, what it means to make a scientific statement. And certainly in the UK now, I think that's beginning to be recognised. So, so universities uh, are beginning to encourage their academics, if they want to, to get out there in public and talk about their research. It's very important. Is that why you, you stay teaching? I think it's perhaps a surprise for people to realise you're still a, a university uh, yeah. lecturer. Uh, what do you think about how young people are engaging with the world of science these days? Well, I, I think that it science seems to be becoming more more popular, um, certainly in the in the UK now. So we, we're getting an increase in the number of uh, young people that want to go to university to do science and engineering subjects. Big problem in the UK. We, there's a statistic which is frightening that in just taking engineering, we need a million more engineers at all levels, from apprentices all the way through to PhDs, in the economy by 2020 in order to just feed the, the high-tech industries that we rely on increasingly in our economy. Which seems and like a gap that can't be closed it, Well, no, it, it will be filled, but it'll have to be filled by taking engineers from elsewhere, or, or those companies will move out of the UK. And I suspect it's the same in Australia. As we go forward, these are the, the modern economies like ours. These are the industries that... that contribute more and more to our economy and we need scientists and engineers. We know that. We know we need more students taking up what we call the STEM yes, subjects, STEM. which is science, technology, engineering and maths. Yep. And yet in Australia, there's been a 20 year decline in the proportion of high school students selecting science and maths in their final years. And a recent report conducted for the CSIRO here found 40% of the Australian public were unengaged, disinterested or wary of science. Well, yeah. And when, when you think that the big decisions we're going to make are informed by Science. They have to be, because what is science? It's the study of nature. It's, the, it's our best view as a civilization at any one time of a particular issue. So whether that's uh, health policy or whether it's climate change or these so-called politically controversial areas, the, the, the point is, how do you make decisions in these areas? You make them based on knowledge. Uh, the best knowledge that we have at the time. It's an economic that, issue, isn't it, for any nation? Well, it's economic. Yes, yeah, it's economically important for us to to be scientific nations. We, we were the the jargon word in the UK is knowledge intensive services and industry, and and almost fifty percent of UK GDP is based on that. Now it's probably similar in Australia, I suspect. So it's the foundation of our economy. So you're right. We need this conveyor belt. Of, of new, excited young people to go into these areas. And, and the question is, how do you do it? I think the media has a responsibility. Um, it, we need to present science on, in the media. I've always said that science needs to be part of popular culture. Why? That, that's not watering the science down. It's saying that that's where, by definition, popular culture means the place where these conversations happen. Well, that's what you do. That's what you've done. I mean, you, are, you can, I think, claim a lot of credit for getting science into popular culture. Your, your TV series on the BBC, a huge rating success. You are yeah. a science megastar, uh, not to make you blush, but is <laughs> that is that having an impact particularly in the UK? Are you seeing, I don't suppose you can claim this all for yourself, but are you seeing that that um, popularising of, of science is having an impact in kids taking it up it, in universities? Well, it, it, it is. So, so there has been an increase. There's been We've reversed the decline, particularly in, in physics and, and in chemistry as well. We're reversing that decline. And, and so the numbers are climbing again. Why? I think some of it is down to the media that actually, and as you say, the BBC should take some credit for this. And actually, I think this is one of the key arguments for public service broadcasters. It's often de debated, you know, in politics particularly. Do we need public service broadcasting? Yes, I would say, because the media is one of the most important influences in our society. And to have broadcasters whose main job is to act in the interests of the country, interests of the nation that funds them, is extremely important, as long as those broadcasters take their responsibility seriously. And this is one of the responsibilities they have. Because I firmly believe, and the evidence is there, that if you just present these ideas, you, see, you make documentaries about the, the origin of the universe, the, the origin of mass, is a life on other planets, any of these things, these questions engage 
students. People love it. I mean, we have we talked to Chris Smith, the Naked Scientist, here on this program, and and he's the Naked Scientist broadcast on this public broadcaster, and it is without doubt one of the most popular mm. segments of, of the week. So people love to engage in these questions when they're yeah. presented in the in in the right way. We have to, and I guess that works the same for students. Yeah, absolutely does, and and so, but we have to fight for public attention. With you know, I, I saw the X Factor final was on here in Australia last night, and it's the same in Britain. So you've got the X Factor, you've got sports, you've got pop music, all those things. Science has to be in that territory, really, whether scientists like it or not, because otherwise we, we, lo we lose out. We're not part of the conversation. Talking about the X Factor, I want to talk about the next book you, you're publishing. I think it's finished, The Human Universe, yeah. Big Picture Look at Humanity. I was attracted by the suggestion that one of the things you look at within it is the question of is there life beyond here yeah. on Earth? What do you think? What did you decide? Is there life? Is there, are there sentient beings out well, there in the universe I mean, beyond it, us? It, we don't know, but I think there's a strong suspicion in which there'll be microbes around, so single-celled organisms, uh, possibly on Mars, very big mission in the near future called ExoMars, which is going to look for life on Mars now because we know there's liquid water below the surface, so we very strongly suspect it. Same with some of the moons of Jupiter and Saturn. So we expect, I think, that there'll be microbes around. But if you ask the question about intelligent life, complex life, civilizations even, it's possible that there are very few. It's possible there may be only one in the Milky Way galaxy at the moment. It's possible. We don't know, of course, and we haven't searched that hard. But if you look at the history of life on Earth, it took 3.8 billion years to get an intelligent civilization. Now that is almost a third of the age of the universe. So that's a long, long time. If it's that marginal, the likelihood, the programs that we know exist and high level scientific programs of, of people spending their time listening mm. for, for sounds and, and on all that kind of proof, is that, is that a waste of money? No, science is not about opinion. So I've just given you an opinion. Uh, there, the, the point is that we have to do experiments. So the only way, ultimately, you will show if there's an intelligent civilization is either to listen or, interestingly, we're now at the stage where we can look into the atmospheres of planets around distant stars beyond the solar system and analyse the chemical composition of those atmospheres. And you could imagine. So it's an industrial civilization leaves a signature in the atmosphere. So, so we might be able to detect life or indeed even civilizations by looking at the atmospheres of planets. So that's what you've got to do. You've got to observe. Brian, while we have you here, can I get your view on a couple of very recent science stories? Late last week, the news of a research unit within the military contracting company Lockheed Martin working on an energy breakthrough, which they say mm. will transform the world. It's called Compact Fusion, and their pro project team is dubbed Skunk Works, which is, it says it's developing a nuclear fusion device small enough to be used on aeroplanes, space vehicles and naval vessels. What do you think of this? If that's right, it will transform our civilization. Um, we, we know that fusion works. It's the way that stars work. And there are very big projects, big international projects, to build fusion power stations at the moment. Um, so, but it's very difficult. But if Lockheed Martin have done that, it will be the, one of the great breakthroughs in the history of civilization because it means you've got unlimited access to free, essentially clean energy, and the fuel is basically water. And the output is helium. And just finally, I was struck by the comment you made, science is not about opinion. In the science of climate change and the debate around climate change, it's very often about opinion and the science seems to get confused or put to the side or debated. Mm. The US Department of Defence published a report on the risks of climate change this week, acknowledging something must be done. And yet there are all these counter opinions that, as I say, seem to ignore the science. How does it, what do you think of that, the fact that the science... The predominant a, science doesn't seem to be necessarily uh, taken at its word. I think it's a misunderstanding uh, of what making a scientific statement means. So it's a very simple question. It's, uh, if we put things, carbon dioxide, etc., pollutants into the Earth's atmosphere, what is the response of the climate by 2100, let's say? Now, there's only one way to try and answer that question, which is to make measurements model what we know about the climate and come up with some estimate scientifically. That's the only way you can do it. My, my challenge to the sceptics, if indeed they're sceptics about the science rather than the policy, being sceptics about the policy is a different thing. But if you're sceptics about the science, my, my response is, well, what do, you, what do we do? Should we look at tea leaves? What are we going to do? We're going to guess. So the only thing you can do 
is modelly. And the models have a large range. You'll see predictions like, you know, between, if we carry on at the rate we are, between 1.7 and 4.5 degree temperature rise by 2100. The reason there's a big range is because the climate is complicated. But it's the best we can do given our current knowledge. So you, you cannot argue with that. You, you, what you can argue with, legitimately as a politician, is the policy response. Is what to do about it. Brian Cox, thank you very much for joining us on Breakfast. Thank you. It's a pleasure to have your company. Brian Cox, and he's here with his new stage show, which is called Brian Cox Making Sense of the Cosmos. Imagine that. And uh, he's got that special one off show in Brisbane, too Journey Through the Cosmos with the Queensland Symphony Orchestra. Mm -hmm.